A lot of times we can find ourselves just going through the motions, if we're honest. I think sometimes we get into a, a good rhythm and routine, which rhythm and, rhythm and routine are not necessarily bad things, but if we're not careful, we make them mundane because it's just what we do. I think sometimes that can be applied to church, especially for those of us who have grown up in the church. We, we know the church. We've been to the church. We've heard, heard all the sermons. We've we know the scriptures. We heard all the Baptist alliterations and the ABCs of salvation. But one thing that never gets old is the God who saves souls. The one thing that we cannot become routine with or go through the motions is with Jesus. I'm guilty of it, and I suspect that so are you. I think there are moments in our lives, in our walk with the Lord, where we need to take time and sit with Jesus. In fact, you know who modeled that for us? Jesus himself. All throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus doing incredible miracles and people coming and being healed and, and just and amazing things happening. And then we see him withdraw. Many times he would tell the disciples, you go ahead of me. And I'm going to go up into the mountain. I'm going to go pray. I'm going to go be alone with God. When is the last time that you just sat in the presence of the Lord? And I'm not talking about busyness. and I, I mean, you, you intentionally took time and said, I'm just going to be with Jesus and turn off all the distractions. I think that's one of the many ploys of the devil is to keep us distracted how can we keep Christians from being ineffective? Well, make them busy about good things. Well, this morning, we're looking at a passage where it's abundantly clear that the person receiving grace and mercy from Jesus responds in an accurate and a worshipful way. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke, or excuse me, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, and immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs and let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the, in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to see Jesus, they came and saw Jesus and the demon possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, 
The man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for being able to gather here today. Father, your people are here. We ask that you would speak. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, you look at Hollywood today, and one could conclude that Hollywood is obsessed with the occult, with demons. In fact, there is a movie to this day haunts me. In fact, whenever Megan and the kids go out of town and I'm by myself, for some reason, this movie just pops up in my mind when I'm at home by myself getting ready to go to bed. The Exorcist of Emily Rose haunts me to this day, just seeing those, uh, the, the things that happen. Now, do I think it's biblical? Probably not. But it's frightening and terrifying to watch movies like that. I don't watch, I call them freaky movies. Right, um, scary movies are not my thing. Corey, however, loves them. I don't know. I would never pay somebody to scare me. All right, I can I could do that on my own. I don't need to pay someone to do that. But it's clear that Hollywood is obsessed with that because that sort of stuff sells. It's also clear that Jesus absolutely believed in demons and demonic oppression. In fact, C.S. Lewis would write about demons in the Screw Tape Letters. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. C.S. Lewis is saying there's a balance, right? We don't disbelieve them because that would be a ploy of the devil to make you believe there is no spiritual forces out there. There are no uh, demonic forces that we're battling. As Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we battle spiritual principalities. And the other is to be so obsessed with them that you give them more power than they have. Here we see a clearly biblical understanding of demons. Took control of a man, led him insane. In fact, the Jewish Talmud gave four signs of madness or insanity. Walking about at night, spending the night on a grave, tearing one's clothes and destroying what one was given. This man was clearly oppressed by the devil and in need of a savior. One of the things that the enemy certainly tries to do in every human being is defile, deface, and try to destroy human beings. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief, speaking of Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In John 8, 44, Jesus tells some people that you are, the fa- you're, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter writes to the believer, says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. It's evident that you and I have a clear enemy. A clear enemy in Satan. It's also evident in this passage that this man was taken over, conquered, captured, by Satan himself. This man was defiled. The Jews viewed the touching of a dead body as an act of great defilement. Here this man was not only probably touching the dead, he was living among them. Satan had taken him down and was trying to deliver a deadly blow. Not only was this man defiled, he was also defaced. The people in the town had driven him away from society. He descended into a life of filth, Loneliness and terror. People feared him because of his strength, but they did not respect him. 
It was shameful to see what Satan had conquered and captured in this man. Well, not only was he defiled and defaced, but he was almost destroyed. This was the plan the devil had in mind for this poor soul from the beginning. Destruction. Death. Howling like a wild animal, cutting himself on the rocks, running about wild, naked, and unkept. He was just a shell of cuts, bruises, lacerations, scabs, and probably infected tissue. Most likely trying to commit suicide. You see, the enemy still has the same tactics today. He tries to defile the image of God, which is you and I. Deface the image of God and destroy the image of God. You see, our current, cli- our current climate and our culture today, we sort of see things superficially on the outside and not in the spiritual realm. You think of everything that's happening in our culture with LGBTQ plus and uh, all the wokeism, everything that's going on. If you don't realize and if you don't think that there is a different agenda, you're wrong. There is a spiritual side of this. Where, God, where Satan is trying to defile and deface and destroy those who are made in the image of God. He hates you. He desires to kill you. To steal any joy that you have and destroy all that is good. Why? I would say first and foremost... He hates what God loves. And you and I are made in the image of God after his own likeness. He seeks to destroy that which God called good. It goes all the way back in the garden. If you don't realize this, you may fall in the first category where C.S. Lewis says, we don't think anything about the devils at all. If you don't see that you have an enemy who's fighting against you, who's doing whatever he can to thwart the goodness of God in your life, to thwart anything good and to lead you to a path of darkness and destruction, my encouragement to you this morning is to wake up. As Peter tells the Christians in 1 Peter The devil is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He has his sights aimed on those who proclaim Christ. Brothers and sisters, if you're in here this morning and you proclaim Christ, you are an enemy of Satan. But praise be to God. Amen. Would you rather be An enemy to Satan or an enemy to God. In fact, before Christ, you were an enemy of God. Ephesians chapter 2 says that because of sin, we all have gone astray and we were enemies of God. But God, who is rich in mercy, saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his Mercy. It's the mercy of God that you and I are enemies of Satan. Well, our passage this morning reveals to us that this demon-possessed man, his situation was hopeless until he met the Son of the Most High God, Jesus, the Liberator. The passage tells us that This demon-possessed man saw Jesus from afar, and he went and he fell down before him. Now, many would think that this is an acknowledgement and a confession of who Jesus is, but it was not a confession. It was not. It was merely um, an acknowledgement of his authority. You see that he first comes and he says, crying out, What have you do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? It's an interesting fact that this demon-possessed man would 
cry out this name above all other names, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. In fact, if you go all the way back to Mark chapter 4, verse 44, this passage sort of sets up, I think, uh, ties into this. I think Mark was leading into this. The disciples were on the boat. Jesus was sleeping. A storm comes, and Jesus wakes up and says, Peace, be still. And the winds and the waves begin to calm down, and the disciples ask a question. In verse 44, who then is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And here in this passage, in verse 7, they find their answer. It's Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. They acknowledged Jesus and gave his true identity. But it wasn't just an acknowledgement and giving of the true identity. It was a Jewish belief that when one was able to figure out someone's entire name, it gave them power over them, to gain mastery over them. And so the demon proclaims Jesus' name in hopes to gain mastery over him. But of course, they're no match for Jesus. And then Jesus asks the demon what their name is. And they answer, we are legion, for we are many. It's interesting to note that a legion was a contingency of 6,000 Roman soldiers. This demon wasn't just one, it was many. And if our math is right here, Probably around 6,000 in one man. Which explains why he was acting the way he was. This superhuman strength and all these different things attributed to him. The demon pleads for the mercy of God. Don't destroy us. Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. The unclean spirits came out into the pigs, numbering about 2,000. And look what happens to the pigs. They plummet to their death. One of the reasons why I believe that the man was trying to commit suicide is because what the demons could not accomplish in the man, they accomplished in the pigs. There are many thoughts about this passage, and I think, it's, I think that's what it is. I think that you see the motive of the demons from the very beginning to destroy. And then look what happens. 2,000 pigs are plummeted, and commit suicide, I guess you could say. And the, 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 the people watching over them are afraid. They go back to the town. They say, hey, you, this is what happened. You've got you to gotta see this. They fled and spread the news about what had taken place, the town gathered to Jesus and they saw the man possessed by legion sitting clothed in his right mind. And the scripture says that they were afraid and they begged Jesus to leave. The commentator says, when people encounter a holy God, there are only two responses. If they do not desire salvation, they will seek to escape his presence. We see that couple times in scripture, do we not? Think of the rich young ruler. Comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him, sell all that you have and come and follow me. And he walked away sad. We see the Pharisees coming before Jesus, leaving angry. I believe it's true that when you encounter Jesus, there's only two responses. The first, you try to flee from his presence. That's exactly what happened here with this town. But the second, those who receive God's saving grace respond to Jesus in a completely different way. They desire to remain in his presence. And look what happens. The town came and they saw the demon-possessed man sitting there clothed in his right mind they described what had happened. 
They begged Jesus to leave. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. He begged him. He he wanted nothing more than just to be with Jesus. He was a new creation in Christ. He loved him. He worshipped him. He didn't want him to leave his sight. And while the town begged Jesus to leave, this man begged Jesus to take him wherever he was going. I could only imagine what was taking place in this man who was near death. There's a hymn, 1911, written in 1911, Abiding in Jesus. In my mind, I picture if this hymn was around, this man would have been singing this hymn. I'm abiding in Jesus. What a blessed place. I am sure he kindly cares for me. He will never forsake me if I trust his grace. In his cleansing blood, I am now free. I'm abiding in the Savior's love. He kindly cares for me. I'm abiding in the Savior's love. This man who was possessed by legion near the brink of death is delivered and saved. And he wants nothing more than to sit with Jesus. And Jesus tells him, no. That's a hard concept to understand, isn't it? I think for for me, the first time I read this passage, it's like, what do you mean Jesus says no? What do you mean he he just wants to sit and be with his Savior? What's going on here? Well, there's a couple of things that's going on here. One, Jesus' ministry was first to who? To the Jews. This man was in the Decapolis, which was a group of ten cities that were of Roman province. There was a couple Jews here, but not many. Jesus' ministry first was to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so for Jesus to take a Gentile believer with him on the rest of his uh, ministry probably would have caused some stumbling blocks, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would have been some stumbling blocks. Instead, Jesus tells this delivered man to go and proclaim all that the Lord has done for you. And guess what he does? He goes, not just back to his friends, as the scripture says, but to the Decapolis, to all the cities, proclaiming all that God had done. He was delivered and sent. Instead, Jesus commissioned him for a mission. Go and tell others how much God has done for you. And he went, and everyone marveled. Well, I think it's evident that those who have been redeemed and saved by this merciful God have a reason for hope and should have a desire, like this man, to tell others about the hope they have in Jesus. Amen? But unfortunately, we become content and comfortable which I believe leads to being quiet about what God has done for us and in us. This man couldn't contain himself. After all, he was on the brink of death. And as John Newton writes in Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing Grace. God would save a sinner like me. That's not how it goes, I know, but get the point. (laughs) If you are in Christ and your sins have been forgiven, you have been delivered from darkness and into his marvelous light. How can you keep quiet about that? In a song called The Lucky Ones, Lecrae has a couple verses that capture this. He says, you're so mindful of us, we rise from the dust. You love these cheating, beating hearts and these eyes full of lust. Gave us power to fight it, though we cower in quiet. We have the faith to start a riot. How can we deny it? 
Brothers and sisters, if you have been saved from your sins, you've been delivered from darkness to God's marvelous light, you and I have a reason for hope. We have a reason for joy. We have ample reasons to tell others about this Jesus. How can we keep quiet? Well, I'll tell you how. We fall into many traps. There's three that I want to give you this morning. One, I believe we become ashamed. If you love the world and its ways, then you will be ashamed of the things of God. In high school, my mother bought me a gold necklace with a gold cross on it. <clears throat> I wore that necklace for about three days. Someone came up to me, pointed to the cross on my chest, and said, how could you wear that? You're not a Christian. I took it off because I was afraid I was ashamed of what people thought of me. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writes to Timothy and says that Demas has deserted us in love with this present world. In 1 John 2, 15, John writes and says, If anyone has the love of the world in them, the love of the Father is not in them. You look at the town in this passage, they loved the pigs more than they did this man. They were more concerned about losing 2,000 pigs than they were about a man who had been redeemed and delivered from legion. That's why they begged Jesus to leave. Not only were they afraid, but he had destroyed 2,000 pigs. If you love the world more than you love God, when the things of God surface around you, you'll become ashamed of them. Not only do we fall into the trap of being ashamed, I believe we fall into the trap of being afraid. Many of us don't share Jesus, talk about Jesus, because we're afraid that we're not knowledgeable enough. The number one fear in evangelism, sharing the gospel with people, is I don't know enough to share the gospel. Well, that's far from the truth because the prerequisite for telling Jesus, telling people about Jesus, whom you love, is loving Jesus in the first place. It's an overflow of gratitude. In fact, John Calvin has a quote that's not on my paper here. Here it is. Though we are not tortured by the devil, yet he holds us as his slaves till the Son of God delivers us from his tyranny. Naked, torn, and disfigured, we wander about till he restores us to soundness of mind. It remains that in magnifying his grace, we testify our gratitude. If you're in Christ, then you have all you need to tell people about Christ. This demon-possessed man, he, he just wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus. Do you think that Jesus gave him a theological understanding, a theological treatise saying, here's all that you need to know, now go back and tell him about me? No! He simply went and told him all that God had done for him. He saved me. I was near death. I was captured and led astray by the devil. And Jesus came and cast him out. I don't know much about this Jesus, but he saved me. I don't know where he's at right now, but I love him. In fact, Paul would tell Timothy, no, you don't see him, you love him. This man didn't go through the school of Jesusology. 
He simply had an encounter with him. And it changed his life. If you've encountered Jesus, brothers and sisters, you have all you need to tell people about the Jesus that you love. Well, not only do we fall into the trap of being ashamed and being afraid, we also fall into the trap of having spiritual amnesia. We forget or lose focus on the great cost our Savior paid to purchase us from that darkness. The cost was great because our debt was great. The truth is, the greater we see our debt, the more we love the Savior. But the problem for some of us is that you think your debt wasn't that great. The evidence in how much you realize the great greatness of your debt is seen in how you love God and love people. In fact, in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, there's a woman who comes in as Jesus was teaching and takes her hair and anoints it with her tears and sits at the feet of Jesus and weeps. And the Pharisees scold Jesus and say, if you knew what kind of woman this was, you wouldn't let her in here. And Jesus tells the Pharisees, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. You want to know the truth? There is no one in here who has been forgiven little. The problem is, you don't realize how great of a debt that you had before Jesus. And the more you know that, the more you understand that, <laughs> the more you love and cherish the Savior. This man, this passage, knew very well the debt, the greatness of his darkness. And you see in the overflow of his love and his gratitude how much he understood that. In fact, in John, the Gospel of John, Jesus says, By your love, others will know that you are my disciple. It's evident in how you love people and love God. And I believe it comes from an understanding, an awareness of how great our debt was and how much God forgave it. Jesus basically tells this delivered man, go and be my witness. You were lost and now you're found. You once belonged to Satan, but now you belong to the Son of God. And out of gratitude, this man goes wherever he can to tell people about the Jesus who saved him. When is the last time you told someone about Jesus? Jesus. Are you ashamed? Are you afraid? Have you forgotten? Do you know just how great a debt Jesus paid for you? When is the last time you just knelt in his presence and worshipped him? Brothers and sisters, it's past time for the church to just go through the mo motions and play church. Too much is at stake and our Savior deserves all of us. The world around us is literally dying to hear about Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. And we are His chosen people tasked with the, proclaim, with the, the, the call to proclaim the Savior to those around us and to the nations. One day you and I are going to stand before Jesus and give an account. 
that day is going to be great and marvelous and fearful at the same time. What if, what if you and I were able to stand before Jesus in confidence and not in shame? Now, I'll tell you right now, if you're ashamed of him now and you're afraid to tell of him now and you've forgotten all that he's done, when you stand before him, you're going to be in shame. But you and I right now can have confidence. We can be bold. We can stand for truth. We can simply tell others about the Jesus that saved us. Not because we have to, but because we desire to out of gratitude. Like this man who was possessed, we simply just want to sit with Jesus and tell others about him. Why? Because he saved a wretch like me when I didn't deserve it. He called my name and I rose out of the grave when I should have remained there. The goodness and kindness of God our Savior appeared to us because of his mercy. How unloving of us not to share that mercy with the world. How unkind to have the cure for death and to sit and watch. May it not be so of us. May it be said of us that we loved our Savior so much that we couldn't stop telling people about him. May we be known for that. Let me pray. Father, Father, we come to you this morning and we ask for your forgiveness. Father, we apologize for our busyness. We apologize for our lack of focus, making it about us. We ask for your forgiveness. Father, as we, as we think about this man who was possessed and delivered and sent, we know that this is really a story of us as well. You delivered us and you call us to go. You call us to proclaim your goodness to those around us, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our teachers, to our family, to the nations. Father, may we be obedient, not because of religion, but because of our relationship with you. My prayer for us this morning, God, is that we would simply sit at your feet and worship you. And as we sit and we worship, may the overflow of our gratitude go out into the world around us. May it lead us to have conversations about what we love the most which is you. Father, we, we ask that you would move in our hearts and do what only you can do. Draw us to yourself. Do your work, oh God, do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.